From the year 2000, Ireland started to see something it hadn't really experienced before. Familicide. The act of killing one's own family. Greg and Debbie Fox married in 1990 in St Killian's Church in Talla. A while after this, their son Trevor came along. Two years later, Killian completed the family. They had moved to Port Arlington. I'm not really sure how long they were living here. But 18 months before our event takes place, they moved to a small little village called Castle Daly near Moat in County Westmead. Greg and Debbie bought a supermarket and a small petrol station. So it just had like four little pumps outside. They bought this from local man, Sean Kelly. And so they actually lived in the bungalow, which was attached to, to the news agents. Debbie would tell people that they had moved there for their boys. They wanted them to grow up in a safe area. They settled into the local primary school and made friends pretty quickly. The Foxes quickly became part of the community. Obviously, running the shop, they became a familiar face to those coming in to get the newspaper, to fill up their tank. Locals would later say that the couple were well-liked, that they were hard-working, and that they appeared to be happy together. They said the two little boys were mischievous, but well-mannered. On Friday 27, 2001, Greg and Debbie went to the local pub, Fitzgerald's. This is somewhere that they were seen often socialising. The next morning, Saturday 28th, locals went towards the shop to see that the shutters were still down. The newspapers were still outside covered in plastic. It was just after 9am and the neighbours thought this was weird. They began to get worried and so a neighbour knocked at the door. There was no answer. So he went around to the back of the bungalow where he saw the door of one of their cars open. When he looked into the back window, he saw Debbie lying in a pool of blood. Gardy were notified and on the scene in minutes. Gardy made their way into the house and found Debbie, who they confirmed was dead. They searched the rest of the house and found the two little boys in their rooms dead. Greg Fox would be found in a semi-conscious state on the floor shop. He had slid his wrists. He was taken to the Port Nicola Hospital in Ballinasloe, where he had an armed guard at his bedside at all times. The deputy state pathologist, Marie Cassidy, arrived on the scene and then the bodies were taken to Longford Westmead General Hospital. The postmortems would show just how horrific their deaths were. Debbie had a fractured skull and stab wounds to her chest and throat. Trevor, the older of the boys, but still only nine years old, had 31 stab wounds. Seven-year-old Killian had 16. Stab wounds on their hands show that they both fought desperately to stop their father killing them. After the awful event, locals would start speaking about the father and husband, Greg. Originally, he had been described as an honest, likeable man. But anyone who knew Debbie would describe him as obsessive and jealous, saying that he controlled every aspect of her life. On the Monday, Greg was discharged from the hospital and brought to Athlone Garda Station. Quickly, a mob gathered outside and by the afternoon, they had to lock the guard station. Greg would tell Gardy what happened. He said that they had been at the pub and when they got back, the translation doesn't seem to be there, but he says that an argument started and that Debbie said she didn't love him anymore and that she was going to leave him. And so he basically essentially says that he snapped. He said he started to punch her in the face and she fell into a table of beer bottles, knocking them to the ground, and that he then took one of the broken Budweiser bottles and stabbed her in the throat. While she was on the ground, he started to bang her head off the kitchen floor. He then took a kitchen knife and stabbed her, but this wasn't enough. He went into the storeroom and came back with a hurl and a butcher's knife. He began bashing her over the head with the hurl, fracturing her skull. When he was done, he took the butcher's knife and went to his son's bedrooms where he began to stab them in their face, their hands, their neck and their trunks. He then obviously had attempted to take his own life. The one detective on the scene said, if there was ever a hell on earth, it was in that blood drenched house. Its interior bore more of a resemblance to the inside of a busy abattoir than a family home. When Greg Fox was being brought to the car to bring him to court, 150 people outside screamed abuse at him, some breaking through the barricade and kicking the car he was in. 
At court, his solicitor, Hugh Campbell, asked for a medical assessment to be done. Fox mainly sat looking at the ground. His arms were heavily bandaged and his left arm was in a sling. At times, his body shook uncontrollably. I don't know, was he crying or something? And it's said that once he almost fell over. He was remanded to Cloverhill Prison until the 3rd of August. Here, after the medical assessment was done, he was transferred immediately to the Central Mental Hospital. When he was due back in court, Fox didn't attend. George Michael Conlon was told that he was being treated by Dr. Kennedy, the chief psychiatrist at the Central Mental Hospital, and that he was not fit to attend court. So the judge issued a sick warrant and said that he would continue to issue them every week until Fox was able to attend. The defence asked for his client to receive physiotherapy in telehospital for the injuries. The following day, hundreds of mourners gathered for the funeral of Debbie, Trevor and Killian. When the case came to trial in 2003, Greg Fox pled guilty to the murder of his wife and two sons. I feel I have caused enough pain to my family and my wife's family, and I do not wish to put everyone through the ordeal of a trial. On the 10th of November, Greg Fox received three mandatory life sentences for their murders. It seems though that after the trial, this is kind of when things, you know, some stuff came out. And in fairness, there isn't a lot in this story. There really isn't. And I'm going to get to that in a minute. But I don't want, like, there's no point of fluffing it up. But this is, this is all we know about the case. He hasn't really told anymore. He basically says that she said he, she was going to leave. And that this is what drove him to do something that he would never do. He says that she told him she was in love with another man, that she was leaving him and that she was gonna take the kids, all this. And I don't really know if that's true because from what I can see in the sources, he's the only one who says this. Even in court it says like it's reported, but it's him who says it, I think. So I don't know if it's nearly a case of he's trying to nearly justify what he done. Like she drove me to it because she said she was leaving me and she was already with another man and you know, she was taking my kids from me rather than her just being like, no, I just don't want to be with you. That he needed it to, he needed more to validate it. Could be, I could be way off, but he's the only one who says that she was having an affair. He says, I loved the three of them. I loved my wife, but she didn't love me. She was going to leave me. And then one source, Flesh and Blood by Nicola Talent, actually says that um, Debbie's friend Mandy Barrett had spoken to the Irish Mirror newspaper and said that Greg Fox had actually moved out of the family home the month previously. So you would think then that there was already kind of a separation in place. And then I imagine, was it a case that they went out for drinks at night to talk about things maybe? Or I don't know, they could have even been just talk, needing to talk about their children or something, you know, arrangements. Perhaps he then took this as a sign that things were going to progress back in the relationship. Maybe then when it came to that, you know, and she was like, no, I don't, you know, I'm serious about splitting up. Maybe then that's why he lost it. And then the fact that the car, the, the car door was open actually makes me feel like it, there was more of a rush um, back at the house. That, they, you know, had, they, I don't know, had they driven back um, when they had been drinking. But, you know, was it kind of a, I don't know, it doesn't say whose car it was. Could it have been a case that she was getting out of the car, uh, as in like, right now, bye. And then he got out in a rush to go in after her. I don't know. All, to be honest, all that's just speculation. But Mandy Barrett says, he decided what makeup she wore and the length of her dresses. I remember one woman friend wanted Debbie to go with her to the cinema to see Bridget Jones' diary, but Greg would not allow her. He said going to the cinema would lead her to go to pubs, which would lead her to go clubbing. So he stopped it. His solicitor read out a statement apologising to both families. And he said that it was the collapse of his marriage that was the catalyst for bringing on a chain of events that he would never, never have done otherwise. And even that, it's like, she drove me to do it. It was her fault. Like, it's placing the blame back on her. Greg Fox has now been in prison, you know, just over 20 years. And by now, normally someone who has had a life sentence would be out. But obviously he had three mandatory life sentences. And I didn't see if they were um, concurrent or consecutive. But I'm hoping that that adds weight to it and that he will still be in for a long time. There is no news when I try source anything, you know, about... Because sometimes there'll, there'll be bits of news about 
people although i find that's more the whole high profile you know there'll always be stuff about you know people like Graham O'Dwyer and all these other ones and you know they're like oh they're friends with this other person and all this a lot of them who just keep their head down there won't be much to talk about so i just couldn't find anything more on him if you happen to find anything please let me know you can put it down below for for me and everybody else to see this is the first of these cases i've covered i I would I would be very familiar with a lot of them um, and I to be honest I had been quite unsure about whether I wanted to do them um, the same as when I done Mary Boyle's video it was the first time to do anything about a child and I was very hesitant but these cases I suppose deserve to be talked about as well and so while looking into all this I came across two different kind of bits of information that I found interesting and that I thought you guys might find interesting so in terms of the case of Greg Fox and Debbie, Trevor and Killian, I'm finished. But just some stuff on familicide. In 2016, the broadsheet done an article on, I'll put it down below, basically on murder-suicide in general, but obviously also like familicide, filicide and stuff like that. And it talked about how there's really not a lot of information on it. You know, what causes it, this type of thing. And to be honest, one of the reasons is because because the perpetrator are usually also, you know, commit suicide. They're not there. There's no, there's no interview afterwards to ask what they done, why they done it, what they were thinking for them to be, you know, psychologically evaluated. Any of this, there's no, none of that can be happen, can be done. It also means then there's no criminal trial. There's only like an inquest and the inquest is usually more how, how they died, how they, you know, um, it doesn't always delve into the other aspects on circumstances of the situation. It also says about um like the media being very modest, like modest reporting or, you know, concerned about reporting too much on it or something. But I would argue that that has changed in the last few years. There are some familicide and filicide cases where um the person has been very well documented as constantly, constantly stuff about them and stuff like that. One of the things they do say is that a lot of the time this coincides with antidepressants. So like when they have began taking them or have stopped taking them. Now, it because there's obviously never full medical reports kind of released and stuff like that or, you know, delved into. You don't know really what else, what other history there is there in terms of medical history and stuff, but it just says that a lot of the time you'll see that. Um, antidepressants were also involved it also says that a lot of the cases happen in rural communities which which is true we see that a lot and that the families are usually like that they are very you know integrated into the community the perpetrator who is normally the man but not always and um, is like that a good standing you know citizen they're all you know like they're they're part of the GAA they're part of the church and stuff like this it also says that in the UK, there are mandatory mandatory reports when it comes to familicide, filicide, all of this. It, there actually was one ordered here finally in 2019 and it was handed to the Minister for Justice in July of this year. So there had been delays and stuff like that. So I couldn't find any more on it. So I don't think it's actually been released yet, but hopefully soon. I don't know how long, long that normally takes. But it also says that like that when there aren't reports, you know, with the actual facts and stuff, this can cause then the gossip, the rumours, the this type of stuff. And then finally in Nicola Talon's book, she actually goes on to talk about different kind of reports and stuff. So I hope it's okay. I'm going to read my notes that I've taken from the book. So as I already said, and I'm sure you would already assume and agree, the large majority of familicides are by males. So the husband, the father, and not always a husband and father. There are other situations where it has been brothers, uncles, this type of thing. In America, you'll hear family annihilator. We don't really use that here. We usually say kind of like murder, suicide or familicide. Like you'll hear people talk about like Chris Watts and stuff like that. And they'll say um, family annihilator. And obviously in the US, it's a bigger population. There's a lot more of this that happens. But that phrase was actually coined by the um, professor Jack Levin of the Northeastern University in Boston. He said it is usually middle-aged men who are good providers who come across as dedicated husbands and devoted fathers. 
and family annihilator obviously kind of usually means that everyone in the family has been killed obviously sometimes maybe only one parent has been killed or not all or not all of their children has been killed so family annihilation usually means the entire family is gone he goes on to say that they usually feel isolated and inadequate and it's when they suffer a catastrophic loss so like a financial loss if they you know become bankrupt or something like that or a relationship so usually like that when the marriage breaks down or or they think the kids are going to be taken or something like that they feel this overwhelming sense of powerlessness and it turns they turn on the family they focus on them and then i thought this one was really interesting so neil Webster, the professor of criminal justice in the northern and arizona university he done a study on familicidal reports so in 211 cases over 12 years only five percent of them were female and then the vast majority are by white people caucasians so he says there are two types of familicidal killers there is livid coercive it says these tend to be working class they are usually violent and controlling and they, are, they tend to have a history of domestic violence they are extremely jealous they feel shame or inadequacy um of their lives as a husband as a father all this and then we have civil reputable they are more controlled they are good providers they are usually middle class they appear kind they are a pillar of the community they do not show anger and so these ones are harder to identify they don't show violence towards their family they usually kill because their life has then you know spun out of control and in this one depression is a key sign so I think kind of straight away from the reports anyway, we could see which one that Greg Fox would be in. He would be the livid coercive because it has been reported that he was controlling, jealous, all this. Although I don't think he had a history of domestic violence. And I would argue that the ones we hear about more. No, do you know what? We hear both of them. But we hear like that when a poor woman is... It's usually like when only the mother is killed, so I suppose more murder suicide. You will hear that there was a you know a toxic relationship, a volatile relationship, a violent relationship, that the perpetrator had history of domestic violence and assaults and stuff like that. Maybe not necessarily even against this victim, but in the past. And then you do have the other ones that come as a shock because the civil reputable like that, you're not expecting them because in in a sense that could be anyone. If it turns that, because obviously everything is inward, they turn everything inward, they don't show anger. So it's only when they get to boiling point that that's when it happens. So, But it says that both types will have an overwhelming sense of shame, fear, anxiety. And as I said, so like the first type, livid coercive, will use hostility and anger, aggression, intimidation to mask their or insecurities, their shame. Whereas the civil reputable submerges it. And then obviously it's only when it gets to the boiling point that it comes out. And then I thought this was interesting. It says that in most cases, the shame stems from failure to live up to the dominant modern ideas of masculinity. Masculinity, and then it does also say, or femininity, if that's the case. Which I think we can all agree on. You know, there is the whole thing of men have to be tough. Men don't cry. You know, men are supposed to be the providers. So I think even a lot during like the recession and stuff that would have hit a lot of men because they lost their jobs and stuff. And all of a sudden it was they were a failure because they were no longer providing for their family. Obviously not an excuse to kill anyone. But I get what they're saying with that. And then I don't know, I suppose just people need to see see someone talk, talk to someone, talk even like that, talk to your wife about these feelings because ch chances are she doesn't feel like, oh, you're a failure, you know. There are some other, I'm kind of going off into filicide now, but I just, again, thought this was interesting information, so I just wanted to share it with you. Filicide, which is to kill one's children, is usually female, is predominantly female. And what it kind of says is that where men will think they own, own, you know what I mean, that their, their focus, let's say, is the wife and children, they own the wife and children. 
whereas the woman usually doesn't kill the husband or the father or whatever they they kill their children because and again it's not that they own them but it's like that their their focus is on them and it says that these usually the women will usually use a more um quote gentle form of killing and that this is this is a last act of protection from the mother you know as the mother to their children usually it is because of a delusion that they are then saving their children from like future hardship depression is almost always an issue dr patricia casey says schizophrenia psychopathic depression severe postnatal depression and hypochondriac like hypochondriacs delusions are often present when a parent particularly a mother kills she also says that in the past doctors didn't ask about suicide but that they have now you know Hopped on <laughs> that they have learned now that they need to when these signs are presented with them they need to talk to the person about this but that they don't talk about homicidal feelings a 1969 study by professor philip j resnick is still used today um for like examining filicides so his study child murder by parents examines 131 cases of parents who murdered their children and then attempted to uh, commit suicide, whether they did successfully or not. 88 of these were mothers and 43 were fathers. And this next bit really is really sad, makes me sad, but I definitely get it. The study found that the most dangerous period for victims was in their first six months of life when a suicidal mother was more likely to think of the baby as a possession and feel inseparable from him or her. Postnatal depression is huge. Um, and I think a lot more probably suffer with it than it's deemed. And so the six months, it's actually I think up to a year. So if you have a baby, there is a there should be a perinatal like mental health team, midwives that are just for the mental health. And you can see them from the nine months that you are pregnant and for up to a year after that. So if you are having a baby, for anyone out there who's pregnant, if you're having a baby and you feel, you know, something's not right or anything like that, even if you're just having worries and you just need to talk to someone, if you feel like you can't talk to your own GP, so I know sometimes people feel like they can't, you know, because it's close or maybe they know their, they know their family, they know, you know, because it's the family doctor, you ring the hospital and you say that you need to make an appointment with the perinatal uh, midwives and again after you have your child you can do that you can go up to uh, a year as far as i know if not it's six months or nine months but it's definitely at least six months but i think it's a year and then just the last bit of information i'm going to give you is resnick puts filicide into five category or five types so he says altruistic filicide so this is when the parent usually the mother is suicidal and it's almost like an extended suicide so they're they're taking the children's lives as well so that they're not like that the hardship or anything like that or that they won't be left to be taken by someone that they you know deem wrong or anything like this you know they just feel like they can't even though they want to go they feel like they can't abandon their children acutely psychotic filicide is when a parent kills under hallucination um epilepsy or delirium the third category um is unwanted child filicide which is self-explanatory the fourth is accidental and is usually the result of battered child syndrome we see that a lot in abuse cases where obviously they've just been abusing the child for so long and then like that one day it goes too far or it's been too much for them and then the last one is spousal revenge which is usually to make the other parents suffer. And I think that one is actually more associated to the men. Um, I don't know, that seems any time, any kind of cases that I've come across like that have usually been for, it's a man, it's kind of like, well, if, I, if I'm not going to have them, you're not having them. So that's kind of it. Um, let me know what you think of this case. Yeah, I'm not going to really ramble on. So thank you for watching. Let me know what you think of the case. Let me know what you thought of the information there at the end, the statistics and stuff like that. And thank you. We will see you in the next video. Bye.